my pleasure to introduce a person you all already know because he's been hosting us today, uh, Dr. Aaron Tajani. Uh, he's a researcher and educator with the Therapeutics Initiative, a clinical assistant professor with the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC, and a medication use evaluation pharmacist at the Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services in Vancouver. Um, I, to, oh, the, the simple way to put it is that um, Aaron is the most compelling uh, question asker, um, and he's never afraid to challenge assumptions, even if they're coming from experts in high level places. And that's something uh, that he uh, thankfully shares with all of us and inspires us to attempt to do. Um, and now he's going to uh, ask some hard questions about uh, prophylaxis for influenza. Please Great. Thank you for the kind words, Jessica. And in that intro photo, if you look closely, you'll see my little dog, Maisie, at my rear wheel, she's so tiny you might have missed her, but uh, it's a funny part of that photo that always makes me laugh. Okay, I'm gonna switch to my slides. Um, and hopefully you see them. Okay, so this uh, topic has troubled me like many other topics for many years. And it was very interesting. I learned a lot in developing the slides for all of us. So the topic is a safety net, with several holes, the, uh, the dissection of the evidence for oseltamivir for influenza prophylaxis, but also to give you some insight on a fascinating story. So let's get started. If you have anything nice to say about me or my slides, you can contact me through any of these means. I'm speaking to you, Jamie Falk. No criticism, please. I mean that jokingly. So let's get right into the, the slides. I want to go over first uh, uh, some of the concepts or the ways in which oseltamivir or Tamiflu has been studied. Uh, and I view the oseltamivir prophylaxis as the kind of safety net. We think that if we use Tamiflu in people that may be at risk from developing the flu, that we might prevent the flu or its complications or deaths associated with uh, the infection. I'm not exactly sure what the intent is of most people, but that is kind of the reasoning behind it. And when it's been studied, it's been studied in community prophylaxis or when there's an expectation of possible near future exposure to influenza, also in what they call post-exposure prophylaxis, using the drug following probable exposure to influenza but before symptoms develop, example household prophylaxis, and outbreak control in nursing homes is another a place where there were two randomized controlled trials uh, conducted with Tamiflu. And then finally, I may refer to ILI, and what I'm talking about is influenza-like illness, uh, which is uh, no lab confirmation of influenza in your system, but you present as though you have an influenza-like illness. And I may refer to index cases, which is in the case of prophylaxis, where I'm referring to the person that has influenza that is putting other people at risk. So let's start off with the first audience poll question. And that is, what are your expectations? If you have seen oseltamivir prophylaxis used, what do you expect will happen? There are the options there for you. Okay, uh, and so the, uh, it's changing rapidly. <laughs> About 40% say all of the above. About 30% say reduce the duration of influenza. Uh, about 15% say reduce cases of influenza. Only 10% say reduce the complications of influenza. And very few people say reduce influenza deaths, but deaths. But by far the most popular answer is all of the above. So it looks like a mix of duration uh, of symptoms, the cases and the complications. So uh, hopefully when I tell you the rest of the story, you'll see if the evidence meets your expectations. Okay, I call this section, don't just stand there, do something. And it's because there are large organizations that I think uh, provide strong recommendations for using drugs like Tamiflu for prophylaxis and we'll go through what they say. Uh, first is the uh, AMI Canada guideline group that published a document in 2019, the use of antiviral drugs for influenza, a foundation document for practitioners. And in there, they refer to post-exposure prophylaxis. And remember that is when you have people that have been exposed to someone that has influenza, uh, 
and they refer to it as an efficacious strategy, but do not provide details in terms of the outcomes we were just talking about in the poll. What do they mean by efficacious? They also talk about residential care outbreaks and revert to chemo prophylaxis uh, as a recommended treatment for controlling outbreaks of influenza. And again, I'd question what they mean by control. Do they mean eliminating the risk that anyone around the person, the index case will get influenza or fewer people will, or people might get influenza, but they have a lower risk of complications. They just say they recommend it for outbreak control. And then finally, this surprised me a little bit. They refer to what is called early treatment strategy, which is used in place of post-exposure prophylaxis. So you have an index case putting people at risk, but because they're concerned about resistance, instead of giving them the prophylactic dose of Tamiflu, why not just give them the treatment dose? And in my reading of the literature, I wasn't able to identify any trials that looked at that patient population specifically. So this seems like somewhat of a leap of faith. Well, let's talk about PICNET or the Provincial Infection Control Network of British Columbia. And in their guidance document, they refer to antiviral agents, including Tamiflu as an important adjunct to helping quickly control outbreaks of influenza and limiting the spread of influenza. So I suppose by quick, they mean the faster you give prophylaxis to the people that are at risk, the better chance you have at limiting the spread or reducing the number of cases. So what do you think about the harm related to Osel's Tamivir? This is another poll question for you. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this question is because the organizations that I just showed you spend little time talking about any harm, if there is any harm associated with use of antiviral drugs. So what is your understanding at this point? So let's see. So 50% right now say assumed it was relatively safe. 30% uh, says caused minor harm frequently. 20% causes serious harm infrequently. Uh, and 10% minor harm infrequently. So it's interesting to note that uh, most people, 40% said relatively safe and uh, infrequent risk of serious harm and frequent risk of minor harm. So that's generally uh, when I've talked to practitioners in residential care, asking them, why are we using so much Tamiflu? They've said, well, you know, it's relatively safe. And uh, even though the evidence in their mind was not compelling, that it's relatively cheap and unlikely to cause problems. So we'll see if that holds up to the evidence. Okay, uh, the other group of organizations that I think pushes us towards uh, influenza prophylaxis is the health authority order sets, or at least for those of you that are not from Canada or British Columbia, I'll share with you a couple of examples from the lower mainland. First, the Fraser health authority order sets, one of the largest health authorities in the province. Their order sets look like this. Uh, one thing to note is that they do not have an option for you to say, I do not want to give my patient prophylaxis with also Tamivir. They just give you give you options for dose and they suggest the time that people should be on uh, in an outbreak setting. And of note, they say Oseltamivir has a wide safety margin and causes no serious dose-related adverse effects. Basically saying, don't worry about it. The reason we're, I'm making up stories, but the reason they're not giving you an option to not check the box is because it's safe. And then another example from Vancouver Coastal Health in which I was pleased to see that they do have an option down at the very bottom to not give Oseltamivir prophylaxis, not because I think people shouldn't give prophylaxis, but I think prescribers should have the choice. And the most prominent part of the order set is the taking off the box for prophylaxis, but choosing the dose. So just another couple of examples how the implication is prophylaxis is a good idea. I see uh, a question here that, I, that people are hoping I'll cover the treatment of influenza. If, if I have time, I'll discuss that briefly, but the focus of the presentation is prophylaxis. So if you don't re recall this image, it's uh, from the Wizard of Oz and it's the time where the characters go to see this magical mythical creature called the wizard and little Toto pushes back the curtain and reveals there's no magical wizard. It's just this guy that's fooling people and the truth rest behind the curtain. So this is where 
I'm most fascinated about the Tamiflu story. It's what happened as a result of the first Cochrane interview. And a doctor by the name of Dr. Hayashi told the first Cochrane reviewers that there was a problem, that their analysis that suggested that Tamiflu for treatment of influenza was uh, beneficial. And what he suggested was that the key piece of evidence underpinning their review was based on manufacturer pooled uh, studies, most of which were unpublished. And so the Cochrane team took on that challenge and set out to request the unseen trials from the company and regulatory agencies. And what you end up finding when you read the story in a simple Google search of Tamiflu, BMJ, Jefferson, Doshi will under, uh, will turn up many documents that I read. And it shows that the real safety net in all of this is Jefferson, Doshi and their colleagues, and especially the BMJ for advocating that the companies release the unpublished information. And essentially, uh, this is the team. Uh, you'll see on the very left is Tom Jefferson and the guy in the white jacket is Peter Doshi. Uh, and basically what they point out is that the regulators like the WHO looked at six pages of information and recommended Tamiflu but had not vetted the underlying data. CDCs from around the world were encouraging countries to stockpile Tamiflu on the basis of that six page document but had not vetted the underlying data. And the majority of Roche's phase three treatment trials were unpublished a decade after completion. So this information that Jefferson and Doshi uncovered not only informed them about the treatment trials, but also for the prophylaxis trials. And that's what I'll share with you today. So the, the contrast is Jefferson and Doshi, after four years of requesting the data from Roche, ended up getting full clinical study reports for 107 studies, not 10, and had about 150,000 pages of information to go through, not six pages. And you can imagine that the, the conclusions from their analysis were very different from the conclusions of a, uh, based on a six page report. Okay, so to lighten the things, lighten the load a little bit before we get into the heavy data, I'll ask you, what is your favorite Wizard of Oz character? You can go to Slido to answer that question. <laughs> uh, the most popular answer is Toto, and I would agree. He, he pushed back the curtain. A uh, few people are answering Tom Jefferson. That was my vote. He was not in the movie, actually. Uh, so, uh, and then the lion, if I had a second choice, I'd pick the lion, too. Um, I actually played the lion in elementary school in a production at school. That just reminded me. That's funny. Okay, so let's get into the evidence, all the facts. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the prophylaxis RCTs, and there are five of them, two in adults, two in the elderly, and one in what they call free-living populations, and we'll go over the information as it relates to influenza outcomes and harm, and a particular cause for concern. Uh, just to point out some of the problems with the data, it, it was surprising that influenza-like illness was not defined in any of the RCTs, and in fact, going through all of the RCTs, Jefferson and Doshi uncovered eight different definitions of symptomatic influenza, which made the analysis complicated. And they noted specifically that harm was systematically underreported. And I'll give you two examples, just two of why they came to that conclusion. First, you'll note in this uh, Roche funded trial that they offered patients $300 for participating in the study, excuse me, and they said that they would not get their money if they dropped out of the study. For example, if they withdrew due to an adverse event, they would not get the money. So it was felt that this was improper coercive procedure that people may not have withdrawn due to adverse events because they wanted the money and that would affect the reporting of those types of adverse events. And similarly, but more uh, concerning was in the Japanese regulatory a dossier for Tamiflu, they noted that in some prophylaxis trials that compared low dose versus high dose Tamiflu, that there were neuropsychiatric adverse events that occurred in the high dose group, but those were not included in the summary tables of neuropsychiatric adverse events, thereby uh, a, a substantial underreporting of that type of toxicity, which is concerning. <clears throat> 
what they did note was consistent signs of minor harm caused by oseltamivir. I, I refer to this as minor, you may differ, or the patients that experience this may differ. But in summary, headache was common, number needs to harm 32. In other words, for every 32 people given prophylaxis, one developed a headache. And nausea was also a uh, number needs to harm of 25. For every 25 people with Tamiflu, one developed nausea. What's more concerning is the serious harm. And what Os uh, Doshi and Jefferson uncovered was the psychiatric harm associated with oseltamivir with the number needed to treat of 100. A special note that I'll make, what they said is in the treatment trials, people had suggested that, well, maybe we're giving Tamiflu a bad name. Uh, influenza can cause sometimes psychiatric like symptoms, and it's unfair to classify those as due to the oseltamivir, it may be due to the underlying illness. That's not the case in the prophylaxis trials because Tamiflu was given to people without influenza. So it's a better sign of what the drug is actually capable of doing. And you can see that at the bottom, overall 47 people had neuropsychiatric adverse events versus 19 in the placebo group. Uh, to give you some more detail, the facts, sort of the information behind the curtain that was uncovered in the psychiatric category, several rare and severe single events, nervousness, ag aggression, hallucination, psychosis, suicidal ideation, and paranoia were reported more often with oseltamivir. And if you added the non-significantly more frequent or numerically more frequent events, such as depression and confusion, that gave the effect the number needed to harm of 100. So every 100 patients exposed to Tamiflu for prophylaxis, they don't have influenza, one would develop a neuropsychiatric adverse event. And that's compared to what AMI, the Canadian guideline group talks, uh, says about harm, is that a causal relationship between oseltamivir and such adverse effects, or a wider spectrum, including delirium and hallucination, hallucinations has not been definitively established. They do, in fairness, say close monitoring for patients treated with oseltamivir is advised. But I think uh, you can see how uh, the depth of information on harm in the AMI document is substantially inferior to that of more comprehensive documents from Doshi and Jefferson. But it's interesting to note that the, the AMI document came out in 2019, but they also had access, if they didn't want to read the 274 page Jefferson review, they could have read the 52 page product monograph that does, I think, not a comprehensive job, but a better job of explaining the potential risk of psychiatric adverse events with Tamiflu, as you can see highlighted here. So I think this is a substantial hole in the safety net. Why aren't the regulators, AMI Canada, PicNet, health authorities warning us of the risks of Tamiflu, especially in prophylaxis. So these are people that have not yet, yet developed the infection. And the unintended consequences, it had me thinking about potential prescribing cascades. So you have a residential care population where many elderly people for maybe several weeks at a time during an outbreak are given Tamiflu. They develop psychiatric symptoms like delirium that aren't recognized to be possibly due to Tamiflu are thought to be just underlying problems developing in the patient that get prescriptions for drugs like antipsychotics to treat the delirium. And then we have a nasty situation of polypharmacy occurring. So that, that does worry me a little bit. Okay, let's get to the influenza and the influenza-like illness outcomes from the five randomized controlled trials in prophylaxis. Um, you can see that influenza-like illness was not reduced versus placebo. And this took some work by uh, the Cochrane viewers in that they had to, because there were no definitions for uh, this outcome, they had to piece together the symptoms that mimicked an ILI-like definition. And in their analysis, they showed no si significant reduction in influenza-like illness in the patients um, exposed to Tamiflu. For symptomatic influenza, they did note the reported data shows a reduction, statistically significant reduction, so for every 33 people given prophylaxis, one fewer will, it, will develop system, symptomatic influenza. The concern with this is the following. They did not detect a statistical reduction in asymptomatic influenza, which is weird, right? Uh, and they proposed the following, that this discrepancy is possible if oseltamivir reduces symptoms 
due to a central action, but doesn't reduce the risk of viral transmission. That would explain why asymptomatic influenza is not reduced, but there's a reduction in symptomatic influenza. So let's refer to the other hole in the net, um, which is that in the prophylaxis trials, there's very little uh, knowledge to be gained on mortality or complications of the flu or duration of flu symptoms. So if we go back to the one of the first poll questions in terms of your expectations of what prophylaxis can accomplish. Uh, we don't have any information that would justify some of the reasons you may have for ticking the box. And getting back to the central action, Tom Jefferson had this interesting quote, in, quote which he says, it's not specific He's referring to Tamiflu. It's not specific to the flu virus at all. It has a central action, lowering temperature and thus making the patient feel better. If prophylaxis with oseltamivir only suppresses symptoms, then infected people could be going to work and school feeling fine while passing on the flu virus. So to me, that's a cause for concern. So the poll question for you now is, is influenza, influenza-like illness evidence for Tamiflu what you expected? or something different. Let's see what you say to this. Okay, I'm glad that only 10% said never thought about specific expectations, just did what I was told. Um, and, but 57% are saying not as good as expected. So that's what I was hoping to clarify some of your issues around what you thought would be accomplished by ticking the box versus what is actually accomplished based on the science. And one final poll question, is the oseltamivir harm evidence worse or better than you expected or you just thought it was relatively safe? And let's see, it's 91% or 81, let's say about 80% are saying worse than expected, about 20% what you had expected and only 1% saying, no, I thought it was relatively safe. So that's encouraging that this in information is useful to you. So I know I have to wrap up. I'll finish with the following slide. Again, like Kate, I'm more of an academic pharmacist. I don't deal in clinical pharmacy at all. So I don't understand all the issues you encounter when you're dealing face-to-face -face with patients and prescribing decisions. But I will share with you at least how I interpret the evidence and how I think it might be useful for you. And I title this slide, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. Uh, based on your expectations and what I suggested the reality was in terms of the science, I think it's fair to say that we can all acknowledge that serious and minor harm is increased without a clear evidence of benefit with Tamiflu prophylaxis. And by saying there is no clear evidence of a benefit, I'm referring to the fact that Symptomatic influenza seems to go down, but not asymptomatic influenza. And remember, all of these trials were industry-funded trials with significant risk of bias. So any of the reported data that I showed you is likely an exaggeration of the truth of what prophylaxis would do in a real-life setting. And finally, I'll leave you with this thought or challenge. You can exercise your right. Make a conscious choice for oseltamivir prophylaxis for the patient in front of you. And I think it's completely reasonable not to tick the box when you are given a preprinted order or standardized order set that says there's an outbreak in a residential care facility or otherwise. And people are suggesting that Tamiflu prophylaxis is a good idea. I think one reasonable option is to say, no, I don't think it's right for my patient. And with that, I will end my presentation. And thank you so much for listening. And Jessica, uh, maybe- I'm gonna you help you with questions. Thank you, Aaron, um, yeah. because I have patients in long-term care and I don't tick that box. Um, I, I must say I learned even more today that uh, encourages me to continue that and will help me have discussions with my colleagues who, uh, who don't feel the same way. So thank you. I always learn something new from you. Um, there's a few questions uh, in, in uh, Slido. I just want to start with a point of clarification. Uh, Dr. Tajani, will your presentation be posted in the online syllabus? Yes, it will. I apologize. I was working on it till yesterday evening. So you will have a link to all my slides. And any questions you have, you can always email me and I'll be happy right. to answer them. 
Um, there's a few comments about harms and benefits. I'm going to try to group those together. Um, there was a comment that harm also includes the costs that uh, the drug is not cheap. And Doug Danforth said, you also have to remember the pharmacy time that's involved because it requires hours of time to adjust the doses, individually package and process. Um, plus uh, patients are required to have renal function tests. Um, any comment on that? Well, uh I remember when I worked in a hospital pharmacy dispensary and the scattering of resources for people when an outbreak was declared to get the lab test and the renal function checked and to start distributing the prophylaxis was not an insignificant amount of time. And I've heard anecdotally from many of my pharmacy colleagues that it just sends people scurrying and it, and you know, really for what? Uh, so I, I sympathize with those comments. Okay. Um, there were also some threads about benefits. Um, one person stated, um, there are no benefits from Tamiflu in my opinion. Um, another person, and I'm not sure if they're referring to prophylaxis or treatment, but they said, my understanding is there's no good evidence of oseltamivir uh, in terms of difference in outcomes of death and hospitalization. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you, do you feel like you wanna take a minute to comment on um, the evidence the around? Yeah, sure. I, I'll just say briefly, I haven't done as much reading uh, recently on the treatment side, but uh, I would point you to the Jefferson and Doshi Cochrane review on treatment. Uh, it's very compelling information that suggests that uh, the claims that it reduced uh, Tamiflu has any impact on complications or mortality is, is not compelling or definitive, and that if it has an impact on symptoms or duration, it's in the magnitude of hours. So in the past, the information suggested fewer days of symptoms that had something to do with the way days of symptoms were counted. So there's an arbitrary threshold. Uh, so if you hit a certain number of hours, it was counted as a day. So essentially the report identified something like a 15 hour reduction, again, in biased trials funded by the company that makes the product. So likely an exaggeration. Okay. Uh, uh, top comment is uh, Dr. Tajani. I think that the therapeutics initiative should rename themselves as the medical MythBusters. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next uh, most popular is from Dave Urquhart, I think. Uh, Dr. Tajani, as with many prescribing practices, this can feel like a mob mentality. I've received complaints from patients, nurses, and others about physicians who do not follow the herd for these common and widespread practices. It's an uphill battle. Dave, um I miss hanging out with you and uh, it's nice to see that you're on the call and hopefully we'll go hiking again one day soon. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to do with that. I, I think maybe the first step is to uh, concede uh, the argument at the point uh, of an outbreak and do what you think is right for your patient, but then try to find a way to engage uh, the team or the ward or the clinicians that work in that area and say, okay, for the next outbreak, can I show you what where my beliefs come from and why I'm not ticking the box. And then maybe you can gain some ground the next time the situation arises. But I, I think it's developing relationships and for people to have an understanding of the other side of the story. And you may, you may start to convince a few people. There's some related questions. Um, who in the health authorities is pushing the use of Tamiflu? Shouldn't they see this presentation? Um, and there's a related question, any suggestions on steps to get it removed from the order sets? Uh, very good question. So uh, depending on the health authority, there are antimicrobial stewardship groups. There's also infection control departments and uh, both play a role, at least in my areas in developing guidelines. And I think, uh, how do I say this diplomatically? I, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with this belief that uh, it's a relatively safe intervention, Tamiflu prophylaxis, and if there's a chance of reducing the spread of influenza, then why not? I think what gets muddled up is elderly people in residential care, if they get influenza, things aren't going to go well. No one's contesting that. The, the issue is, can we do anything about it with Tamiflu? Uh, and that, to me, is a problem. So for first steps for me would be and what I've tried to do is engage the people in infection control uh, in a discussion about the evidence as well as antimicrobial stewardship. And it, and it is uh, a multi-step 
uh, discussion, but I think it's worthwhile having. Yeah, and one of the comments suggests uh, having a refusal box added to the Fraser Health um, orders on their preprinted set. Um, top comment here, Dr. Tijani, it sounds like if you give Tamiflu to an entire nursing home population, you will have several patients with neuropsychiatric effect, uh, uh, effects and those may go unrecognized. Absolutely. I, I mean, I have no evidence to substantiate that, but it seems like if the randomized control trials are showing a clear signal and if people, and I'm generalizing, feel that these drugs are relatively safe, they may not connect the dots. And then the worst case would be they, uh, they, they have decreased quality of life and then followed by adding drugs to treat the symptoms. And then the outbreak is over, the Tamiflu stops and those drugs stick around and cause harm for other reasons. So it's gave, given me an idea to talk to my epidemiology colleagues at the TI about a possible observational study. Fair enough. I'm going to just close with one more comment where we, I tried to allow a little overtime because you, know, you got a late start there. Um, this is uh, from Anonymous. Uh, if Tamiflu is centrally acting, is there an additional concern for use of it in prophylaxis during the COVID pandemic? <laughs> yes, 